In the previous video, we went over the double slit experiment and described why even single quantum particles, like photons and electrons, exhibit an interference pattern. Additionally, we glanced over the mathematical background to justify this behavior. And even though we didn't explicitly describe every single step in detail, we explained that since we have a superposition of waves from the bottom and top slits, we arrive at an equation for the probability density at the screen, which clearly describes an interference pattern. It is also worth remembering that the reason we only get a cosine term without a reduction in intensity as we move away from the center of the screen is due to the fact that we made several simplifications in our derivation, like assuming the distance to the screen is significantly larger than the separation between the slits, ignoring single slit diffraction, and assuming we were dealing with just plane waves instead of a more realistic wave function, like a wave packet. Similarly, we show that for the case in which we measure the particle right at the slits, we no longer have a superposition, but rather a single wave emerging from either the top slit or the bottom slit, producing no interference at the screen. And once again, the reason we derived a constant probability density across the screen rather than the sum of two probability distributions concentrated right where the slits are is due to the simplifying assumptions we made. Now, in this video, we will discuss how we can map the double slit experiment onto a quantum circuit and run this on a real quantum processor. If you're not that familiar with the model of gate-based quantum computing, all you really need to know is that we represent quantum state using qubits, which are basically abstractions of some physical quantum entity. Qubits can take either a value of zero, one, or a superposition of zero and one. So a concrete implementation of a qubit could be, for example, the spin of an electron, which would take a value of zero when we have spin up, or a value of one when we have spin down. And then we have quantum gates, which basically represent unitary evolutions of our qubit. So in the case of our electron, this would correspond to electromagnetic waves capable of changing the spin of the particle. So to model the double slit experiment using a quantum circuit, we start with a qubit initialized in state zero. We then apply a Hadamard gate, which basically places the qubit in an equal superposition of zero and one. Now, this is equivalent to what we had for the double slit experiment, where we had a wave function of a particle in a superposition of going through the top slit and the bottom slit. We then apply what is known as a phase gate, which is responsible for adding a relative phase between state zero and state one. Now, if we want to assign some physical meaning to this phase, we can think again about our electron model, where state zero is the electron pointing up and state one is the electron pointing down. So a superposition of zero and one would be, for example, the spin of the electron pointing out of the screen. So changing this phase is equivalent to rotating the electron on the plane perpendicular to the spin in the up direction. But then, what does this phase represent in the double slit experiment analogy? Well, if we think about it, what we're doing here is changing the relative phase of the wave emerging from the bottom slit with respect to the phase of the wave from the top slit. And if you recall, this is exactly what we see when we move along the screen, a change in relative phase of the incoming waves due to the difference in the lengths of the paths they have to travel. So basically we can say that changing the angle phi is equivalent to moving along the y coordinate on the screen. Lastly, we apply another Hadamard gate to our qubit, which recombines the incoming waves, just like the first Hadamard gate split our waves into a superposition of top and bottom. And if we work through the math, we can see that what we get is a cosine and a sine term as a function of the angle phi which basically corresponds to the interference terms that we are looking for. Now, an important aspect to keep in mind here is that in the double slit experiment, we had a wave function traveling towards the screen in a superposition of all possible values of that Y coordinate. But here, the angle phi is a single constant value we apply to the phase gate. 
A way to think about this is that running one of the circuits with a specific value of phi is somewhat equivalent to just looking at what happens at a particular value of the y coordinate on the screen. So the probability of measuring zero in this circuit is equivalent to the probability density of measuring the particle hitting the screen at a particular y coordinate. And the probability of measuring a one in the circuit is equivalent to not measuring the particle in that particular region. Then, in order to fully model the double slit experiment, what we need to do is run this quantum circuit for varying values of phi that cover a similar span to that on the screen and look at the statistics of measuring a zero. Having established that measuring a zero for a given phi is equivalent to finding the particle at a given value of y in the double slit experiment, we can compute that probability and see that it's identical to what we got for the double slit experiment up to some normalization factor. And again, the probability of measuring a one is basically equivalent to the probability density of a particle not hitting the screen in that particular given value of y. So, Comparing our circuit model side by side with the double slit experiment, we see that we get the same interference pattern where the angle phi is simply a scale version of y that depends on the distance between the plate and the screen, d, the separation between the slits, s, and the wavelength, lambda. Now we can repeat the same analysis for the case where we measure which slit the particle goes through. Once again, we apply a Hadamard gate, which places our particle in a superposition of going through the top slit or the bottom slit, but then we immediately perform a measurement. And therefore, instead of having a coherent superposition, we now have either state zero or state one, each with 50% probability of occurrence. Then after applying the phase gate, either state zero or state one acquires a global phase, which if we think again about our electron model, this phase was equivalent to rotating the spin on the plane perpendicular to the z-axis. So if we ha either have a spin up or spin down, changing this angle will have no effect on our spin, so we can basically ignore it. And then our last Hallermar gate was there to recombine the waves from the top and bottom slits, but since we only have one wave or the other, what we get in both cases is an equal superposition of zero and one. Now recall that in this model, the probability of measuring a zero corresponds to finding the particle at a given location, and the probability of one is that of not finding the particle in that same spot. So what this tells us is that it is equally likely to find or not find a particle in any given y coordinate on the screen. In other words, we get a constant probability distribution irrespective of the value of phi, so no interference. Now in the next video, we will demonstrate how we can implement this quantum circuit using Python, simulate it as if we were performing the double slit experiment sending individual quantum particles one at a time, and then run it in a real quantum processor, which is equivalent to performing our own real version of this experiment.